So a lot of you guys in the comments have been asking me to talk about a lot of college stuff and a lot of computer science stuff because I guess like those are the two types of fields my videos cover. So I thought this video would be a really great idea for people who are interested in both. Just a quick disclaimer, obviously there's no actual top five best programming languages for students list. This is completely subjective in my own opinion. And obviously I don't know that much about computer science. I've only been in school for three years. I haven't even had a full-time job yet. I just had internships, but this is just from what I know and what I've learned from work and from school. All I hope from this video is just that maybe this video gives you some insight or just a good way to start if you're interested in computer science. So let's get to it and let's start off with the best program language to start with, in my opinion. You might already guessed it, but I definitely think that it's Python. And why Python, you may ask? It's because it's very simple to use. The syntax is very simple. It's easy to read. It's kind of like almost like typing in English. It's high level, so you don't have to worry about low level things like memory management and things like that. And it can cover a wide array of different fields in computer science. It covers web development, data science, scripting, machine learning, and much more. If you aren't familiar with what a web framework is, it's basically like a system set up to help you make like a website. So some examples of web frameworks that you can use with Python are Flask and Django. Flask is a much more simpler version, whereas Django is a full stack web framework, so it's a little bit more advanced. But a lot of jobs, you can definitely look it up online if you're going on like Indeed, LinkedIn, or things like that. There's always companies looking out for Django backend developers. So the next big field that Python covers is data science. In school, I've taken some data science courses, and at my previous internship, when I was looking at what the data science team was working with, I saw that they were using the same technologies that I had had used in school. Data science is very easy with Python using Jupyter Notebook or IPython. So basically you run this on your machine and instead of having to have your text editor and then like your console and you're seeing what your code will print to your console, instead you have this really nice laid out notebook where you have your, you have boxes of your code if you run it right underneath, you can see the graphs, visualizations, or any other type of things right in front of you. My professor for my data science class last semester made Jupyter Notebook, so that was pretty cool. So why is this good for data science then? Python is good for data science because there are a lot of popular libraries that use Python that provide a lot of functionality for data science techniques. For example, Pandas is one library that a lot of data scientists use using Python and it's really good for data manipulation and analysis. Another library that a lot of people use is sklearn or scikit-learn, and that just provides you a whole array of different machine learning methods and tools that you can, you don't even have to worry about like implementing the behind the scenes, you just use the package, put in your inputs, and then I swear to God, like in an hour, you could probably train a machine learning model or start to train a machine learning model. So another library that's really popular is NumPy, which provides you a lot of high level mathematical functions for arrays and matrices. And this is really important because for a lot of data science techniques or machine learning techniques, that I've learned so far. You work with a lot of high level linear algebra computations, so you wanna be able to use arrays and vectors, and NumPy provides you a way to work with that. And lastly, there's another library called Seaborn, which is really good for data visualization. So you, any types of graphs, models, things like that. Seaborn has a lot of these plotting and graphing methods available for you to use already. All right, so let's get to number two on our list of top programming languages for students in 2019. So the second language that I would recommend is definitely JavaScript. And why JavaScript, yeah. So JavaScript definitely has seen a huge surge in the past decade because a lot of websites now are much more interactive and a lot of browsers like Google Chrome implement JavaScript. So JavaScript is really good for front end development. So if you're interested in design, UI and things like that, and not just like the design, but actually implementing it into like a website interface, JavaScript is really good for that. So let's say you're building a website, you already know HTML and you already know CSS. So you can already build a static website where maybe it's like your home page that loads look like, hi, I'm Edward, uh, quick bio about me and that's it. But you wanna add like cool little things like things coming out or you wanna have like some live timer or like all of these random different types of things that you see on websites, you're gonna to have to use JavaScript. It's actually really cool too that you can actually build an entire full stack application just using JavaScript. And this is possible because there's a lot of tech stacks where they only use JavaScript. Some popular ones are the mean stack and the Mern stack. So what does mean stand for, you might be wondering. So just really quickly, just for like a full stack application, what do you need? You need a client, you need a backend server, and you need a database. The client is what the user sees and how they interact with our website. Whereas the backend or the server is how we handle the client's request. And like, let's say you're going on Facebook. If I click my profile, that client client sends a request to the server and the server needs to know that, oh, the front end just sent a request from my homepage. So now I need to know how to handle it. So what the back end server does is it knows this, goes to the database, says, hey, I need the information about Edward. The database sends it back to the back end server and then the back end server sends that data back to the front end, but the data is sent to the front end in a way where it's like a nice UI, which is what you see on like Facebook or YouTube where things are very nicely arranged. Back to the mean and the Mern stack. So for the mean stack, your database would be MongoDB. E stands for Express, A stands for Angular, and 
N stands for Node, and they all in, in all JS. So Node and Express are basically your backend. Express is a framework for Node. Don't worry about this too much, but I just want you to understand like what these four letters stand for. And A, which is Angular, would be the front end framework that you would use. So the difference between MeanStack and MernStack is just that instead of using Angular, MernStack uses React, which is a very popular front end framework right now for JavaScript developers. So on to my next point about front end development. I really want to talk about React. It's a super popular front end framework or like technically a library that's great for building user interfaces. Learning React is a really great tool and it's a very marketable skill. And some other JavaScript front end frameworks that are available, it's not just React and Angular. There's Vue.js and there's Ember.js and there's much more. In my previous internship, I worked with Ember.js, but personally, I think it might be a little bit outdated. So I wouldn't really recommend learning like an older framework, probably just go with what's hot and new, so like React. The next thing that's actually cool is there's a thing called React Native and it's a mobile app framework. So typically developers, when they're making mobile applications, you either go iOS or Android. If you're iOS, you learn Swift and Objective-C and you code in like Xcode or something to make applications. Whereas if you're making an Android application, you'll be working in Android Studio and just coding in Java. But the thing is that if you're making an application, you would have to know how to make an iOS app and have to know how to make an Android app if you wanted your app to be in both markets. The cool thing about React Native is that it's actually a framework that allows you to build cross app platforms. So if you make an app in React Native, it can be rendered natively in iOS or Android, which is very useful. So Node.js is a super popular technology nowadays, and there's a lot of guides online on how to build things with Node.js. For example, like when I was doing a hackathon last year, I literally didn't know anything about Node.js. I just knew a little bit of JavaScript, but I was able to make a Facebook chatbot just following a guide on YouTube. There's a lot of other different different guides online that go with Node.js. Like I'm pretty sure on Medium, there's like an article that says build a REST API in Node.js in like 10 minutes. So definitely a cool technology to know and definitely enables you to be able to create a lot of different things. I think it really comes clutch in like things like hackathons where you're always in like a 48 hour hackathon, right? You might spend like 10 hours just like painting out your design or your idea. You wanna be able to build what you have in mind as soon as possible so that you can make it even better than what it originally was. There's always that team member or a couple of team members that are super good with some type of tech stack in JavaScript. Build the application really quick and since they don't have to worry about time anymore, they go out and beyond and they probably use like an API from one of the companies that are sponsoring the hackathon, which definitely gives you some points when being judged. So to wrap things up, I think JavaScript is a really good language if you want to be able to build applications, especially really quickly. So for number three, I would say it's Java. Definitely a very well-known language, super popular language. It's really good because it gives you a solid foundation of computer science principles, I think. It's an object-oriented programming language, so you learn the paradigms of that. And in my opinion, I think it's very good to solidify your understandings of common data structures. So like trees, linked lists, hash tables, all those type of things are already in Java. And for me, like in our data structures class, which was in Java, we would have to implement these data structures from scratch. So it's really good to like solidify those type of things. Also, it's easier to use in C++. A lot of schools use C++ for their data structures class. And I think that's good, but I just think Java probably makes your life a little bit easier. So like mentioned before too, if you know Java, you can build an Android application in Android Studio. And what Android Studio looks like is, so there's like text editors like Sublime, Atom, and those type of things, but there's also IDEs and JetBrains has a really good one for Java called IntelliJ. So if you code in IntelliJ for your Java projects, then you'll be really comfortable with Android Studio because that's what it's based off of. And lastly, I think Java is a really good language to master if you're practicing leak code, prepping for interviews, and all that good stuff. I think that answering a lot of these like interview questions or providing solutions for these things in Java is much more easier. Like if you're reading input, you have like the scanner class. If you're using a data structure like a stack, you know exactly how it is. You know the exact runtime for like a doubly linked list. If you're using Python, you'll be using like a dictionary. Uh, your code will be maybe a little too simple for you to catch mistakes with and all that stuff. So because of these reasons, I think Java is a really good language to learn. So coming to number four is C and also Go. I think it's really good to learn C because unlike Python, it's a very low level language. So you have to worry about pointers, you have to worry about memory allocation management, and a lot of other things like that. You can basically work directly with the hardware and it really helps you understand or get a better grasp of how the computer works. But personally, I wouldn't start off learning with C because I think it's much harder to learn. But if you do start off with C, it makes learning the other languages a lot easier. Like if you went from C to Python, it'll be going from like AP calculus to like algebra one or something. I would personally say that going from Python to Java to C is like a good route of languages to learn. And lastly, C is really good because it's just really quick for performance. And now you might be wondering why did I mention Go also? So Go or Golang, I think that's how you pronounce it, was made by Google. And you have to think that if it's designed and supported by Google, it was probably designed by Google to solve their problems of like supporting scalability and effectiveness. And like Google is like such a huge company if they're using it, it's probably a good idea for your company to use it. And for example, like in, in Toyota Connected, which was like the company I interned last summer, a lot of the team 
teams started learning Go and using Go because they thought it was much more better. So what is Go? Go is a language where it provides you the high performance like C, but it's much more simpler and fun to code in like Python. A lot of microservices are written in Go. For example, like Uber's engineering team was able to make like the highest query per second service by using Go. So a lot of these microservices that a company will want to have are written in Go because of their scalability and quickness. And things like Docker and Kubernetes, they're written in Go too. So like if you want to dive into that type of stuff, I would say it's more like production engineering, but a lot I know a lot of people that actually want to go into that. So like if you're interested in like production engineering, knowing Go would be super useful. I don't really know too much about this stuff. I've used Docker only a few times, never used Kubernetes, but I know it's a very popular thing in industry right now. And if you're interested, you should definitely delve into it. So before we go to our fifth language, I quickly want to thank Issue Hunt for sponsoring today's video. So Issue Hunt provides a service that pays developers while contributing to open source code. So a lot of the libraries, like the things I'm talking about, like React and that, they're all public. If you want to contribute to it, like write updates, make things better, there's a lot of developers out there that just in their spare time, they added updates so that other developers using these technologies get a better experience using them. But the thing is, people are doing this as a hobby and not for a job or they're not getting paid for it. So you might be wondering, when would I contribute to open source code? Well, actually contributing to open source code definitely looks great on your resume. So if you want to polish that resume, add in some stuff saying like, oh, maybe I added this new implementation for this library that's being used by hundreds of thousands of users. That's very impressive, but why not also get paid for that? So they do it through a system called Bounties, which is a financial reward grant from whoever who solves a given problem. So these companies, they'll be posting all these different bounties of problems that it needs solved. And if you can solve it, then you'll get paid. So some companies that have already joined the Issue Hunt platform are Ant Design, Material UI, which is used a lot for front-end development, Jekyll, and much more. So just to wrap things up, Issue Hunt provides a platform to help nurture a friendly open source community. Make sure to check down the link below if you're interested, and let's get to our last language. So for number five, I would definitely say important language to learn would be an assembly language like MIPS or RISC-V. Nah, I'm just kidding. Um, actually, I would say for number five, it's any language you want. So as a student, I don't think learning a specific language is really what matters, but instead it's those computer science concepts and those fundamentals that are what are much more important. There you go. If you understand those, then picking up a new language is much more easier. Some other languages I just suggest would just be like Ruby, Swift, or R. So yeah, that wraps up the video. Let me know down in the comments below if you want me to make any more types of videos like this. And also let me know about any programming languages that you thought should have made the top five list that I missed out on. Uh, but yeah, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or wonderful rest of your night and I'll see you for the next one.